So Rhys comes from uh, Rotorua, he's uh, uh, Te Aroa uh, Iwi, uh, working in Hamilton, and he's the kind of head clinical honcho of the uh, mental health and addiction services there and the forensic mental health services. So he's uh, both a general psychiatrist and a, a forensic psychiatrist. He, he did his training uh, in, uh, in Wellington uh, and has also uh, demonstrated his interest in epidemiology as being part of the mental health survey uh, research team some years ago, has an interest in mental health outcomes, uh, and obviously in abnormal offenders and their behaviour, but also in education. So, Rhys, over to you. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, and as Janice said, uh, I, as it happens, did my clinical school training with one or two others in the audience here in Wellington. And um, as you said earlier in the day, Janice, I distinctly, as it happens, remember sitting up in one of those seats up there uh, when Graham Melsop, uh, the then professor of psychiatry, described the discrepancy between, in, in health outcomes between those with serious mental illness particularly uh, and those of the general population some 30 years ago. So um, it, it, it has been a problem that has been, us, been with us for a long time. What's really interesting, what, what would be really interesting to me is to know whether it's any more of a problem now than it was then. Um, I think that's an interesting thing to think about, given some of the things that we ourselves have done in terms of treatments and the like since, uh, and whether we've improved any of that or, uh, as some of you might feel, made some of that worse. So uh, my talk is called Modi Ora Tato Katoa, A Call for Action, uh, and I guess that the first thing that I would like to say is that... Um, as we go forward in accepting some responsibility for action, we should also, all of us, be really clear about exactly what that responsibility is and responsibility to whom and for what. Because I think one of the things that Tony said uh, quite clearly is that it is quite important to be really clear about that. And I think we're not, we haven't always been clear about that. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, our experiences in the Waikato, I would like at this stage to say that some of the things I'm going to tell you about we've done and we're proud of, some of the things that I'm going to talk about we'd like to do we haven't yet done, uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge that there are a number of other district health boards right around the country that have done many of these things and many more things. But I thought it might be useful for today's talk to take uh, a slightly different perspective in terms of thinking about what are the similarities when we're considering some of these disparities in health outcomes, what are some of the things that might be similar when we consider the uh, disparities in health outcome as experienced by Māori. And the reason that I um, wanted to do this was firstly because I think it is a really interesting way of thinking about the challenge before us in terms of health disparity for people with serious mental illness, but equally of course uh, it is important to remember the double whammy situation, which is that we know that those of Māori ethnicity have poor outcomes, we know that those with mental health disorders have poor health outcomes, so we can pretty much be guaranteed that those who are Māori and have a mental health disorder are going to suffer that double whammy. And of course, to varying extents, we know that that's the case because when we look at the mental health epidemiology study that we did, we know that Māori disproportionately suffer in terms of health burden, in terms of the severity and chronicity of illness, and in terms of the sorts of help that they can expect to get uh, having suffered that disorder. So what are some of the similarities? Uh, we know that there is significant socioeconomic disadvantage for both groups. We also know that lots of people would like to put the negative health outcome just down to just the socioeconomic problem. Uh, but in fact, as Ruth earlier today and others in the uh, Māori health sphere will tell you, that in both groups it's not just down to being socioeconomically disadvantaged. There's something in the case of being Māori about being Māori and coming into services and something about having a mental illness and coming into mental health services that contributes to that disparity. Uh, of course, also... Um, both groups are what you might describe as a subculture within the mainstream. 
where there's a cultural dissonance often, and I mean in terms of both those who are Māori but also those with mental illness, and that there are, for each group, very significant challenges in terms of engaging with the mainstream and mainstream activities. And many of the reasons, there are many and, and varied reasons for that. I think also in both cases important to remember the tyranny of homogeneity, and you will have heard some of that discussed a little earlier, that um, just as we Māori are all not one big happy group, so too those with mental illness are not one big group. Uh, and we, all of us, based on the, where we sit within those groups, have different health needs. And probably, as I think Tony suggested, uh, and I would agree, need to have those health needs uh, perhaps addressed in slightly different ways, dependent on our context and dependent on our need. Discrimination, of course, for both groups in a whole range of ways is the norm. It's very important for us to remember that and to think about that particularly in terms of how we might decide to provide services going forward, and I'll talk to you a little bit about uh, our experience of that, and where coercion is common. And there's a real insidiousness about this. Um, so there's the blame game, the idea that we all of us have the same opportunity at the front end, so all of us surely have access to general practitioners, that's our own fault that we don't go, it's our own fault that we don't get our blood pressure checked and take our blood pressure pills, um, and that it is in fact of course our personal responsibility. Now we know just with Māori if we continue to tote that line, uh, then actually the statistics are going to get no better, in fact they're likely in some subgroups within those groups to get worse. Uh, and as I said to you before, you know, often times it's all about socio-economic disadvantage, in fact we know that it's not. Uh, it's all in the case of those with mental illness, mental health uh, and addiction services responsibility. Commonly, um, and in fact often, for those of us within mental health and addiction services, we can sometimes believe that in fact it's, all, it's our responsibility. And it's interesting when you have a look at the, as I did over lunch, had a look at the piece of paper, Helen, that I think you, you told us about. In fact, actually, most of those are about what mental health addiction services or those accessing mental health addiction services might do about this problem. And I think one of the problems with that, of course, is it in some ways gets away from the idea that general health services have a whole lot of responsibilities here as well. Particularly if we think, Ruth, about what you talked about, which is the, the pathways model. So if we, even if we acknowledge that everybody gets the same access to services, there's something actually about what happens as they go through that pathway of the provision of services that has to be, at least in part, about the way in which those services are provided. And certainly, of course, Māori have had that experience and there's lots and lots of research to show uh, how that goes. Uh, and that I think health disparity is, is pe perpetuated at every level, and Tony's talked a little bit about this, and I'd absolutely agree, Tony, with all of what you've said about that, that there are all sorts of aspects of the way in which politics and policy funding, and you'll notice, incidentally, that um, I've just not even included planning, because you know, to, I don't know the last time I met someone from funding and planning that could even spell planning. <laughs> the funding nonetheless and providing. I mean, I, I guess in a humorous way the point I'm making is that actually I think that in terms of a lot of the provision of our services, a lot of them are poorly, poorly planned and many of them are not actually planned or delivered against any kind of clear uh, sense of need, which is a stunning, stunning indictment, a stunning indictment. And, and, and yes, we all have to do our bit, but as I said to you before, it's really important, I think, for us to be clear about what our bit is. So, uh, for example, in the case of policy and law, I think all of us could accept our role in terms of advocating for, for and I'm sure that many of you do, but for advocating for good policy and for good law. I mean, I hope that I'm not the only person in this room that is just absolutely astounded with our current liquor law. Astounded. Um, also, of course, the availability of medications, and please believe me, I'm not uh, a pharmac basher. I do believe that there needs to be some constraint, but one of the problems that comes with some of those constraints, of course, is a limitation around the sorts of medications that we might use in certain sorts of situations that might actually allow us to 
perhaps facilitate uh, a better health, uh, physical health outcomes. Uh, and also, of course, alternative modes or models of healthcare delivery, um, wraparound services and the like. So too, in terms of funding, uh, I mean, I, as Tony said, you know, we have a very disintegrated health sector. And I think that we oftentimes struggle to settle on contracts that facilitate integration of the sector. In many ways, actually, many of those contracts do exactly the opposite, that health providers are not necessarily contracted to have to play nicely in the sandpit. Uh, alternate models uh, of primary care delivery. So I think we fundamentally have a system where uh, the district health board and general practitioners to varying extents across the country, uh, operate in their own space. I could never quite understand why it wasn't possible to get a little bit more inventive, particularly for certain groups of people, people with certain sets of needs, why it wasn't possible to get a bit more inventive uh, around that. And I know that some district health boards around the country do have general practitioners coming into their mental health services and actually conducting clinics uh, as a sort of process for facilitating people's pathways back into the community, but I don't think that that's the norm. Uh, and facilitating extended cons consultations with general practitioners, as Tony said, again, there are a number of places around the country where that is done, but again, I don't think that's necessarily the norm. Uh, one of the things about that, though, I think is really important to remember is that a lot of PHAs are already funded to provide, already have contracts for the provision of chronic health care services to those in need. Uh, and so I think it is really important for us when we engage with our primary health care colleagues to be clear about uh, their responsibility for being able to utilise some of those contracts where, where possible to provide these services uh, for people with need. And also a workforce based on health recovery. Um, again, I think something that is uh, done in some places better than others. Uh, and so what is the challenge? And I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the things that we've experienced now. Um, and I think one of the things to remember is that we have to accept this responsibility because we're, we're actually writing tomorrow's history. And one of the, you know, for some of you that, for some of us that were around at the time, Janice, and the provision of uh, mental health services in the um, institutions, you know, we oftentimes feel a little bit embarrassed and feel a little bit sad about what we did, knowing now what we know. And I'm going to think it's very important for us to think about how we're going to look back on what we did now in 20 years, or how our kids are going to look back and think about, you know, what we did and how we did and whether it made sense at that time. I mean, I think that one of the critical things and one of the things that I am, am constantly talking about internal to our services that um, it is really important to facilitate fast and effective recovery um, and that actually the effective treatment of serious mental illness is one of, one of, I believe, the most important ways of attempting to try and intervene and to turn around the potential for a negative <coughs> physical health outcome. Because in terms of my clinical practice, that group of people that have been hardest to engage around things like exercise, going to the general practitioner, taking blood pressure medications, have been that population of people that have been so seriously and chronically disabled uh, by serious mental illness. So facilitating a fast and effective recovery, I think, is really, really important. Also being able to be clear about those high-risk groups, because as I said before, the tyranny of homogeneity leads us to believe that everybody is at the same level of risk, which, of course, we just aren't. Uh, and to treat comorbidity, that's comorbid physical problems, but also comorbid psychiatric or psychological problems. I think sometimes we can get a bit preoccupied with labels such that we miss some of the other disability that sits there for, uh, for people with lived experience of, of mental illness. And we become preoccupied with one thing, uh, not realising that oftentimes, and anxiety is a really good example of this, not realising that oftentimes, although we might be effectively treating someone's psychosis, the underlying anxiety, in fact, is the thing that stops them being able to engage and go to the general practitioner and get treatment. So not, not, you know, not, not losing our way in that regard. Uh, and to focus on relationships, and Tony, this I think is, is really where you and I are agreeing wholeheartedly. And what I would say, uh, and this is partly a, based on our experience <coughs> in the Midland region, what I would say about the importance of, of 
those relationships is that they need to begin in an honest and open way. Uh, and I say that really seriously because I think sometimes we don't necessarily have the conversations, um, the hard conversations that allow us to be really clear and open and honest about what our opportunities but our limitations are as partners in this interaction. I mean, no other relationship would you expect that to be the case. Every other effective relationship requires two parties coming together, being really, really clear, at least not at the, out if not at the outside at some point, about what the imperative of each is. Where are we off to? Do we have shared goals? How's this gonna go? How can we satisfy one another's needs in order to satisfy that goal? Now, a couple of really important examples. Um, and one of those, of course, is, is, is the whole money thing. That we need to be able to be honest about the money go around. You know, primary care practitioners are private practitioners. They're there earning a living. They have to be mindful of that. And so for those of us that are, you know, living in the comfort of getting a, you know, yearly salary, we need to acknowledge and understand that. Because if we can't acknowledge and understand that and have a conversation about that, we're never going to be able to get to the point where we we, we, we realise our agreed goal. So too, and this again is a part of our experience, we need to be honest and open about the fact that not every general practitioner wants to treat people with serious mental illness. They don't want them in the waiting room, they don't want them to come to the general practice, they just don't want to do it. And we can preach to them all we like. Or we can take a slightly different approach, which is to say, for those general practitioners within a PHO that are a bit anxious or a bit ambivalent or perhaps a bit fearful of that, why don't we develop a, what I've described as the coalition of the willing, why don't we actually get on board through the PHO with a series of general practitioners that do actually have a commitment to this in order to be able to show their colleagues that actually it isn't that hard a thing. And as I say that, one of the things that Janice didn't say is that before I went into psychiatry, uh, I did practice a little general practice actually, um, just down the road, just down there at a place called the Newtown Union Health Service, um, who for a brief period of time when I was there had more people on its books with psychiatric disorder than probably the psych unit. So it is possible to do, it is actually possible to do. Um, and I think that uh, the other thing that we realised in terms of engaging with primary care is in some ways there was a kind of a it was a bit of a bridge too far, that it was a really, everybody agreed that it was a really good idea that we should integrate with primary care. Everybody agreed that some people who are in the secondary care service should be back in primary care and that primary care should have much better access into secondary care. But we didn't much put any think, thinking into how we might oil that to happen along the way, given that, of course, the experience of most primary care practitioners is that you know, they send somebody into a psych unit, the person comes back from the psych unit, and then they're incredibly fearful that they're just going to be left to hold the proverbial baby. And so we have to have ways of being able to oil access both ways, for, for service users to be able to get back into primary care and be supported to be cared in primary care. And so that means we having a slightly more flexible model of functioning, being there, seeing ourselves as supporting our primary care colleagues, albeit on a different site, but equally, for someone that returns to primary care, being prepared to take that person back on immediately, without any delay whatsoever, without him to, GPs having to go back through that process of re-referring somebody back into this monolithic structure that, you know, takes quite a, where the cogs take quite a long time to turn. So being able to oil that process, I think, is a really, really Im important thing. And one of the things that was really critical to us in terms of our engagement with the PHO uh, in our region. And so we established a primary integration team, which again many DHBs will have, have, but with the explicit expectation that probably there would be a point in time that that resource would actually probably devolve out to primary care. That's not necessarily a resource or a capacity that we saw as sitting within secondary care services forever. Uh, and then as I said, innovative funding approaches to those extended care consults uh, and as I said, a number of other DHBs have those, but it's really, really important to be clear about the necessity for those if we are actually to have our primary care colleagues prepared and able to spend the sort of time that they need to um, with our patients. So walking the talk in terms of the provider arm, um, so making, reversing this disparity 
uh, a service priority. And there are a whole lot of different ways that we can do that. And Tony's described, you know, we can audit, we can set those KPIs, we can audit against those KPIs, we can share that information across our service and begin to do a little bit of compare and contrast. But I think the other thing is that we, we also need to encourage our staff to live healthy lifestyles themselves. There's, there's nothing worse than, I think, being preached to by somebody about something um, when you know that they have absolutely no credibility in that thing at all. So, you know, having a healthy staff with healthy attitudes. Uh, and access, as I said before, to effective treatment, I think assists, engage, uh, assists engagement and minimises the morbidity and mortality. Focusing on the rationalisation of medications, and I think this is something principally for psychiatrists, but actually for all of us. You know, I think that um, we don't always do that very well, and so we do often have people on medications that they don't need, or on doses of medications that they don't need. Uh, and then um, a focus in a much more, in a much wider way on the other aspects of, of people's life and experience. Healthy living in terms of personal health, housing, family, uh, and the like. Uh, and then lastly, for us to accept the responsibility to accept, to, to facilitate access to, so that's enrolment and actual active engagement with primary care, because I think there's, they're, they're two completely different things. Being enrolled with a PHO and actually going to see your GP are two completely different things. And so I think if we become preoccupied with enrolment as the goal, then, then there's the potential that, that, that we miss the bone. So uh, just talking there about reviews of medication, various health metrics, uh, and then facilitating opportunities for healthy activity uh, and for social, social inclusion. And I'm hoping that most district health board services do that right across the country.